Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel Kalanadi. Today I want to talk about The Moon and the Other by John Kessel. This is a science fiction novel that I read for Tome Topple a little while ago and I went into it completely blind. I truly didn't know anything about this book other than that it was set on the moon in kind of the near future. I didn't know anything about the story or the society or anything like that. And what I found really surprised me and in pleasant ways. So The Moon and the Other is set, I think a couple hundred years in the future when there are about two dozen permanent colonies or like cities established on the moon. And the crux of the book is a particular colony called the Society of Cousins. It's an experimental society set up to be a matriarchy. Um, it is very artificially set up to give women the power and most of the rights in society, and then to kind of dismantle the traditional role of men to reduce like toxic masculinity and its effects. The Society of Cousins is very clearly not treating men and women equally. For example, um, all the families are matrilineal. Only women can establish their new families. Even if men marry women, they remain in their own families. They don't join a new one most of the time. Um, women have most of the authority. They have automatically the right to vote, and they retain complete parental rights over any children that they have. Men don't. They don't have parental rights, um, and in many cases they can't vote. They can opt to choose a career path in which they are completely and utterly supported in. You want to go and be a, a great scientist and you'll have all the resources thrown at you that you could possibly need to do that but you will give up the right to vote. Men can only gain the right to vote if they become what's called a permanent meta worker in that they opt to do a certain amount of physical labor in the colony every week and they're not going to do anything else other than that. So yeah, it's not an equal society. It doesn't treat men and women equally, but it is ultimately a, a non-violent society in which if you're a woman you benefit greatly and if you're a man well it's not that bad either <laughs> the fact that it does a lot to diffuse kind of the concept of toxic masculinity ends up being quite beneficial for men as well men basically get everything they could ever desire except the automatic right to vote and a say in how their children are raised and such. Um, so it works really well for a bunch of people, but of course not everyone. And that is the issue here. This matriarchal colony is surrounded by more traditional patriarchal societies, what they actually call the patriarchies. And there have been and currently are like men's rights movements um, aimed at getting men the same rights that women have. And all of these things, the external scrutiny and the internal movements come to a head in this book. Um, a bunch of the Patriarchal societies want a pretext to go into the society, investigate them, determine whether men are being mistreated or not, and then the internal movements to get men um, equal rights as women. These all reach a boiling point and come to a head at the same time, basically, in the novel. And it's all told through this web of interconnected people who all have some sort of tie to the society, but very different experiences. The book opens with the perspective of Erno, a young man who has been exiled from the Society of Cousins where he was born and grew up. About 10 years before the beginning of the story, he had been involved in a masculinist movement within the society that ended up being very violent. And due to his participation in this as an impressionable young man, Erno was responsible for an event that ultimately killed his mother. Even though he disavowed the movement after that and wanted nothing more to do with its leader who calls himself Tyler Durden, 
um, he's still exiled for his actions. And he has realized over the past 10 years bouncing from one patriarchal society to another on the moon that, yeah, maybe life wasn't perfect in the Society of Cousins, but life in the patriarchal colonies is even worse. He's poor and an immigrant, and he does backbreaking scut work to just barely scrape by, and that's going to be his lot for the rest of his life because he will never go back to the society. He can't go back and he's not sure that he would want to go back. Then we move to the perspective of Mira, a young woman of essentially the same age as Erno, who knew him when they were young, who lives within the society. By day she is a kind of average scientist and by night she is a secret anonymous political activist called Looker, who basically makes performance art video pieces commenting on the political situation and the social unrest within the colony at this point. But what's really interesting is how she's connected to the political female web within the colony and her relationship with a man named Carrie. We also get points of view from Carrie, who is from a, an incredibly powerful and influential family within the Society of Cousins. His mother is one of the most powerful people in the colony. And he has a very complicated and kind of mysterious background where as a teenager, he disappeared on the surface of the moon for three months and then reappeared alive and wrote a book that's in French called The Moon and the Other or The One and the Other, which kind of criticizes the role of men in the society. So he wrote this when he was like 15 years old. He became incredibly famous for it. And now as an adult, he is incredibly charismatic. He's very sexually appealing and he carries on sexual relationships with some of the most well-known and powerful women in the society. He also has a son with another woman from the Green family that he belongs to. Um, his ex-lover Roz um, has the only rights over their son Val. His case where he pretty much runs off with his son to live with him together um, and, and really be his father becomes like this focal point of the reform movement that's going to be voted on very soon. So we have this interconnected web of relationships for people who don't live in the society anymore, people who do, who may want to leave it, people who believe very strongly in it, and then people like Carrie who essentially doesn't have a problem with the system. It's been very good to him, but he wants this one additional thing and doesn't understand why he shouldn't really have it. And it's this very slow build up of seeing all the forces maneuvering and everything coming to a head and, and asking, is the Society of Cousins going to survive? Is it going to collapse from internal problems or will it be forcefully dismantled from the outside by the other colonies and the other authorities on the moon? And if that happens, is it justified or not? The first thing that I thought while I was reading this book is that this situation is incredibly nuanced and realistic feeling in a way that I had really not come to expect from novels that essentially use this idea of a matriarchal society. I think this book is actually a really worthy inclusion in this kind of subgenre of what's usually called feminist science fiction that creates an artificially made or constructed all-female or female-dominant society. You have books like Ammonite by Nicola Griffith where you have a, an entire world where only women can survive there because of a virus that kills men. And how did they develop a society that's only women, no men? How do they come to reproduce? You have something like While Away in The Female Man by Joanna Russ, which is also a world where men are killed by a virus and only women can survive. 
then you have something a bit more similar to the setup in The Moon and the Other with something like The Gate to Women's Country by Sherry S. Tepper, where women have gained power in a particular city, they live very separate from men, they are in control, and they put men in a position and in a living situation to control and deflect and diffuse um, traditional masculine anger and violence, for example. That's a really extreme example. It's not quite the same thing as in uh, The Moon and the Other, but there's this similarity, this particular device which becomes the focal point for the story and the way that it lets the story kind of analyze the social and cultural makeup of a society like this. Like after a hundred years of mixing the ingredients, what's the actual result? Is it working or not? And, and do you agree or not agree with the principles of the experiment and how people are treated? So I was really pleasantly surprised by the inclusion of this particular setup and how it was handled. And I was particularly pleased that I didn't fully like the idea of the Society of Cousins because you know, if you're a woman, this does actually sound like a utopia. Would, would I opt to live in the Society of Cousins if I could? Yes, because it's truly a demonstrably nonviolent society where women actually do not worry about things like being attacked by random men or being raped or not advancing in their careers because of misogyny, you know. Um, it would be better to live in the society if you're a woman. But on the other hand, I really don't think it's a feminist society. I don't think it treats men and women equally and I have a real problem with that. I just don't think that that is the best moral, ethical way to go, and I don't think that it's really sustainable in the long run. I mean, the entire book is about how it essentially isn't sustainable, both internally and externally. The other thing that I really liked about this book that I really came to appreciate was just the way that it's told through basically people's relationships. It has a very quiet and understated feel, in my opinion. I was almost three quarters of the way through the book before I realized how much it was really affecting me and how much it was getting under my skin and generating a real emotional response. Because my first reaction to the characters was usually kind of disappointing. None of the characters here, Erno, Mira, Carrie, Val, Roz, Eva, any of these people, none of them are like the best people. All of them seem to really screw up. Some of them do really um, kind of despicable things to each other. Like Mira completely betrays Carrie at one point in a legal situation of all things. It makes them very real people. They screw up like real people screw up. Um, but I didn't feel like I was rooting for any one of them in particular. I could have been swayed any which way at any point. But the complications with their relationships, how it's all connected, how it's almost like a domino effect when something happens to one person, the, the ripples through this bit of the community that when all these things happen, that was really interesting and really rewarding. And at the end, and probably like the last 50 pages, I found myself almost moved to tears by what happens to Carrie and then just furious at the next thing that happens to Carrie like 30 years after the major events of the book. But also I could understand why a lot of this happened and what motivated people. There's no real villain here. I think the only truly awful sounding person in the entire book is the man who calls himself Tyler Durden, who, who led the very violent masculinist movement that Erno got caught up in. He never actually appears in the book, but he's mentioned a couple of times, like his personality, his persona, his, and his actions. And he's the only person who I thought came across as 
legitimately violent and angry and scary and more villainous. Everything else, everybody else, like even Cyrus Escander from Persepolis, who's quite a patriarch, um, really pulling the political uh, strings, even he has some redeeming and interesting qualities, whereas the other guy probably didn't. Um, but I thought that was also really well done. Maybe the one thing that I didn't quite get, that I just kind of scratched my head and was like, why did you include that? I don't really see the point of including that, were the talking animals. Um, basically, some animals, like dogs in particular, um, have been uplifted, but I'm not sure that the book really benefited from the inclusion of that aspect, that scientific achievement. Perhaps it's commentary on who is considered to be a person who has rights. So, I don't know. If somebody's read this and understood the inclusion of the talking animals more, let me know. I just thought that actually could have been cut without really losing any nuance in the book and it would have been a bit shorter and that would have been fine. And with that, I think I've gone through the list of everything I wanted to say about this book and my reactions to it. So definitely let me know if you have read The Moon and the Other and what you thought of it. Did it get under your skin by the end as well? Thank you very much for watching this kind of rambling review and I will talk to you again soon and until then, bye.